I'm Chad Poole. I'm from the Department of Biological and Ag Engineering at NC State University. I'm the new water resiliency specialist. Um, my primary responsibilities is working with agricultural drainage and irrigation throughout North Carolina. Um, and today, I wish we could have been at the Blackland site having this, but we're in Beaufort County in the Gaylord's Bay community where we've got our open ditch drainage um, research plots and some irrigation studies that I wanted to talk with you about. Um, first, to, to get started, uh, basically one of the things that worries me from a production standpoint is how quickly genetics are changing when it comes to both corn, cotton, and soybeans. And one of the issues we have with that is being able to select the right varieties for the conditions that we're going to see from a soil and water standpoint during the growing season. So what we did this year was actually put in a feasibility study where we hopefully can manage soil and water stresses during the growing season, keep them adequate, have dry land conditions. It was, if we have a drought year, that dry land condition will present that drought year in the yield analysis. Or be able to over irrigate where we can make the conditions wet and see what happens to the overall crop yield. The goal of this is for our producers to be able to pick or have better choices in how they pick varieties. Being able to select a variety that will perform under multiple different soil and water conditions during the growing season that will increase their profitability. One of the other things we want to acquire from this data is how that variety uses the nutrients and inputs that we're putting out on the site. We know that if we have a dry year, we're going to use inputs very differently than we would under wet conditions. So hopefully from this replicated data, we'll be able to collect nutrient use uh, information and make a better determination on when and how to apply those nutrients and ultimately increase your profitability. So to help everyone understand what we're trying to do with this irrigation trial and water management trial, we've got to do a, a, a good job of explaining what happens with stress, both wet and dry stresses during the growing season. Uh, since we did this test on corn here at this site, I want you to take note of this slide. Um, these are stress day indexes that we typically use in a modeling program called DrainMod. And what it does is basically give us an idea of the intensity that we see of the stress during the growing season, whether it be wet or dry. Now, when you look at this plot, what's on the y-axis, they're not used in the same equation. So just throw that out. What I want to do with this plot is really demonstrate when we see the most stress based on these soil water conditions. Looking at this, we see if we're talking about dry stress in corn, which in the last couple of weeks of this site, we've seen some significant dry stress, believe it or not, even with as much rain as we've had in Eastern North Carolina this year. But typically, if we're gonna manage water, when we don't have enough water present in the root zone, we're gonna get the, the greatest yield um, issues occurring between about VT and R2 to R3. That's what we're seeing on that top plot. So if we're going to irrigate, we need to do a really good job of managing water during that period to ensure that we get good yields. Now, if you take a look at the bottom figure there, we're talking about wet stresses in corn. For wet stresses, we see that stress occur pretty much season long. All right, so we have yield losses pretty much all during the year. And we've seen that throughout Eastern North Carolina this year with heavy rainfall events uh, in April and May that caused uh, wet stresses in the corn, and it's gonna ultimately affect the final yields that we get out. But you can see from this plot, from emergence all the way to R2, we can have significant wet stresses affecting the crop, which implies how important drainage is for season long management, having a good drainage system to get that water out of the root zone and make sure that we don't have saturated conditions. So what we're trying to do with this information is tailor a management protocol for this replicated series where we could basically keep it wet season long. Unfortunately, in 2020, we were not able to do that because of the COVID situation. We actually were able to get this project installed in late June and started the process in July. So we're basically focusing on VT through R2 for both the wet and dry stresses. So that's gonna affect us a little bit this year, but hopefully we'll get some good results that we'll be able to present at the winter meetings of how these stresses affect yields and how these um, particular varieties uh, use nutrients. Um, what we did is have four varieties, the top four, four full season varieties, high producers that we chose from different companies. We replicated them four times under those three different water management scenarios. Two wet, adequate soil moisture, and then dry land production. And that's the data that we'll be presenting at the winter meetings based on this chart. And typically what we're trying to do is over irrigate 
um, on one of the treatments, and we'll show that in, a, in an outtake here. Basically, we've got two sub um, drip lines laid out between our plots where we're consistently, consistently irrigating water every day continuously. Now, how do we determine how much water we were putting out? We looked at the historic rainfall for Bellhaven, which is about eight miles away from here. We had a climatic service weather station there for the last 30 years. And I ranked those years with uh, the top year being the wettest that we saw during July and August, all the way down to the driest. And I picked the 75th percentile for wet conditions. And then we divided that by the number of days in the month and we're going to add that amount of water every day regardless of rainfall. So if we do get rainfall, we're going to ensure that we're on the wetter end of that particular period during the growing season. And that's how we're irrigating that. For the adequate soil moisture, we're using a system where we're actually measuring the soil moisture in the field. Now, one of the questions I get across the state is how do we monitor soil moisture and know when to irrigate? So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time discussing that and how we're doing that at this site. We actually have electronic um, sensors in the field in both our dry land treatment and our just right irrigated treatment that we're monitoring on a daily basis. Um, I'm not advocating any systems. There's many out there that you can use, but the point of this is to demonstrate a system that growers can use and one that we feel that we can adequately irrigate with. So one of the questions that I get a lot is how do we know when to irrigate and how do we measure and understand what we're measuring? There's a lot of uh, P, uh, sensors and companies out there right now promoting soil moisture measuring devices and it's important that we understand what we're actually getting when we're making these decisions. So I've got a slide here I want to talk just briefly about to give you an idea of how you make these selections and how you use this information. The first one there's two ways of measuring soil water. There's volumetric soil water, which is the total amount of soil water that's present in the soil profile. That's on the right hand side of this plot. We typically do that with the most economical way as electrical conductivity measurements devices. We're using that at this site here to measure volumetric soil water content. Now, I want to caution you on using these devices because they basically have to be calibrated to the location they're at in the field. And I'll get to that in, in a few minutes. And you also have to understand what you're measuring. You're measuring the amount of water in the soil, not necessarily what's plant available, okay? So if we're irrigating, one of the things that we like to use is a sensor called uh, a matrix sensor or soil potential. And that's otherwise known as a tensiometer. It measures the ability of the plant to remove water from the soil. That's important because that allows us to know when we need to trigger irrigation and whether we're at a point that we're going to see stress. You can use the two devices to determine when you need to irrigate. So if you have a tensiometer that tells you you're at a point where the plant's seeing stress, then you can read off the volumetric water content and you know that you need to start irrigating before your volumetric content falls to that point. Once you have this calibrated for a particular location and site, you can basically use either one interchangeably. You don't need both. But it's important to have both measurements for a particular soil texture so you can determine what volumetric content you want to irrigate at if you're going to use that particular type of device. Very important from a calibration standpoint and understanding standpoint to have both measurements initially before you decide when to irrigate. And I want to give you an example of why that's important. This slide represents the actual measurements we're taking here in the dry land production versus the irrigated production with volumetric water content. If you look at this slide, you can see both of these sensors were installed at the same time, basically under the same moisture conditions. We had not irrigated at all. And there is a very different volumetric soil water content. What that is is spatial variability. So if you're going to depend on one sensor to decide when to irrigate, you better know what the matrix potential or the tensiometer measurement is at a particular water content to trigger irrigation. And I'm gonna explain how to do that with the data we've collected here at this slide. We have several charts that allows us when to trigger irrigation by a soil texture class. And I put one here in this slide to give you an idea if you're gonna use a tensiometer or a matrix potential sensor when we typically need to trigger irrigation. For sands, that's at about 0.2 to 0.3 bars. For loams and silts, it will be at about negative 0.3 to negative 0.5 bars. And for clays, negative 0.5 to negative 0.6 bars. 
Now, as someone that's managing these systems, the easiest way to do this is to actually look for stress in the plant. If you've got these sensors out here and you're able to get real-time data, if first, um, observance of stress, you need to note what matrix potential you are at because you do not want the water level to get to that point. So this slide here is the gravitational water tensiometry measurements from both our dryland irrigated site and our adequate irrigation site here at this, this location. And what I want you to notice here, we actually, by the charts, we have a sandy loam soil. So at about negative 0.45 bars, which is the suction that plant is pulling water from, we start to see stress. So we want the water level um, in the soil to not fall below that line. So we need to trigger irrigation before that happens. And that's documented with a red line on this chart right here. And you can see prior to this week, we saw quite a bit, or at least some level of stress beginning to form with our dry land treatment out here. The, 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 line, the green line on this plot actually fell below that threshold. While we were irrigating, we were successfully able to keep that potential higher than that threshold level, and we were not observing stress during that period, even with temperatures greater than 90 degrees. We're out here on July 16th, and last week we saw a considerable amount of stress uh, coming out of the corn here that was in the dry land situation. This plot shows the matrix potential, tensiometer measurements from both the dry land and our adequate irrigated plots. And you can see on approximately between 712 and 713, we fell below the 0.45 bar line. Um, and that day you could actually see some leaf curl and some stress developing in the dry land corn. So it's important, you know, that kind of let us know that our numbers were correct for this soil type. That's where we needed to be irrigating prior to that point. So we had successfully been doing that with our adequate irrigation trials. Um, but that's a good idea of how you need to cross check a visual reference to what we have in the tables to decide when to irrigate. For you guys that have irrigation systems that do not have tensiometers and are using volumetric water content probes, this slide kind of gives us an idea of how we would use the two sensors interchangeably to develop the volumetric water content triggers that we need to irrigate at. And again, it's very important that you do this at a particular site so you know when to trigger irrigation. Well, I basically have plotted the volumetric water content of our dry land corn on the blue line and the uh, tensiometer data on the green line. At a tensiometer measurement of negative 0.3 bar, we are typically at fill capacity, which means we're at the maximum amount of water that the plant can successfully use in the soil. Okay? What you want to do is figure out when you hit 0.3 bar and come up to your volumetric water content curve and read off that reading. For this particular case, with that particular meter that we have installed, is 27.2 percent. So that's the maximum you would want to irrigate to, otherwise you're going to waste water. You're going to lose it through drainage or ultimately generate runoff. Now if you can continue to do that through the growing season, you'll get down to that same period on 712 or 713 when we started seeing stress. That fell at a matrix potential of negative 0.45 bar. We just simply read up to our volumetric water content line and we're at about 25 percent. So to successfully irrigate, we'd like to keep our volumetric water content for that particular meter between 27 and 25% for this soil type. Now every soil type is different, which is why it's important to calibrate those meters to the conditions you have on your particular site. So when we're calibrating these meters and we're looking for a volumetric water percent of when to irrigate, why don't we just put more? The simple facts is, if you over irrigate, if you put more water than the plant can successfully use or the soil can store for plant availability, you're going to lose it. You basically are going to cause that water to drain out of the soil profile because it cannot be held by the soil. All right, and that costs you money. That's energy consumption to pump that water out there and it's just a loss of valuable resources. So this, this uh, calibration procedure that I'm talking about is very important to make sure that we're adequately using the water we're putting out there and doing it as cheap as possible. You know, and we don't want to keep it at fill capacity. You don't want to stay at 27% because we're going to get rainfall. We want to get that um, soil moisture condition as close to that first sign of stress as we can and try to maintain that level because it's going to happen just like it did 
uh, last night, I'm sorry, the night before last here, when we got a two, almost a two inch rain that we weren't expecting. Had we been at fill capacity, that water would have ran off and not been used by the crop. So it's very important that we deplete some of the soil water, but not so much that we see stress because that allows us to store the naturally available water and saves our, saves our pocketbooks from a profitability standpoint.